The treatment of chronic pain has taken a conceptual shift over the last few decades. Pain, particularly chronic non-cancer pain, has been encouraged to be treated with opioids. Across the country, we're now seeing the negative consequences of that approach through an increase in opioid dependency, accidental drug overdoses, heroin use, and a public expectation that a pill can be prescribed for any discomfort. In addition to mortality and quality of life consequences, we are seeing an increase in communicable diseases associated with substance abuse disorders, strains on the court system and treatment programs, and a lost generation of patients dependent upon opioids who are a challenge to treat humanely and effectively. The problem exists, so we can't wait for it to be on the front page of the paper. We can't wait for it to be a larger problem. We need to be Roll up our sleeves like Midwest Nebraskans do, get to the heart of the problem, and just un rip off the band-aid and talk about it. Opioids are powerful drugs that can create calm and relief when used wisely, but cause great harm when prescribed without discretion. Every encounter with a patient in pain requires the same analysis, which should guide all treatment recommendations. What is the etiology of the pain? And would non-opioid treatment suffice? Are there risk factors present that would make the use of opioids unsafe for this patient? What is the usual expectation for pain in the patient's condition? Is my patient's response outside of the expected range? Is there a medical justification for this dose of opioid, for this length of time, for this condition, in this patient? Practicing outside those parameters puts your patient, their family, or the community at large at risk. Too many pills prescribed for a given situation can create dependency in your patient, or if stolen or diverted, feed the illicit habit of others. This is a public healthcare crisis, and all of us in healthcare professions have to assume responsibility to fix it. To achieve genuine and lasting practice change, our entire medical community has to be educated concerning our current understanding of the appropriate management of pain. All of us need to understand the science that underlies current best practice recommendations and our patients and families need to hear the same message. We felt the best approach would be to promote a grassroots effort, achieving statewide broad support for the guidance document. Providers would share common understanding, our patients would hear a consistent message, and the community at large would support these efforts. Almost every type of physician that sees patients is going to be touched by the opioid problem. And even if a physician is not prescribing opioids to a patient in his or her practice, chances are that patient is seeing another provider, uh, whether it be an emergency department or a dentist or a podiatrist that's done a surgical procedure. And so one has to be aware of the potential hazards of opioid use. Task Force members come from a variety of backgrounds and perspectives, as you can see on the screen. They are dedicated to providing safe and effective treatment to patients while keeping patient safety as the primary focus. With the release of the CDC guidelines, we have focused our attention on operationalizing these nationally recognized best practices. Our goal in the development of the Nebraska Pain Management Guidance document is to provide real-world tools and advice to practicing clinicians as they work to comply with national standards. Let's start with a look at the CDC guidelines on opioid prescribing, which were released in March of 2016. Their importance cannot be overstated as they establish national recommendations for the use of opioids for the treatment of chronic pain. The Nebraska Pain Management Guidelines are organized to ensure the compliance with the CDC guidelines. Here is a brief summary of the 12 CDC recommendations. On determining when to initiate or continue opioids for chronic pain, the CDC says, one, non-pharmacologic therapy and non-opioid pharmacologic therapy are preferred for chronic pain. Clinicians should consider opioid therapy only if expected benefits for both pain and function are anticipated to outweigh risks to the patient. If opioids are used, they should be combined with non-pharmacologic therapy and non-opioid pharmacologic therapy as appropriate. Two, before starting opioid therapy for chronic pain, Clinicians should establish treatment goals with all patients, including realistic goals for pain and function, 
and should consider how therapy will be discontinued if benefits do not outweigh risks. Clinicians should continue opioid therapy only if there is clinically meaningful improvement in pain and function that outweighs risks to patient safety. Three, before starting and periodically during opioid therapy, clinicians should discuss with patients known risks and realistic benefits of opioid therapy and patient and clinician responsibilities for managing therapy. In regard to opioid selection, dosage, duration, follow-up, and discontinuation, CDC guidelines state, one, when starting opioid therapy for chronic pain, clinicians should prescribe immediate release opioids instead of extended release or long-acting opioids. Two, when opioids are started, clinicians should prescribe the lowest effective dosage. Clinicians should use caution when prescribing opioids at any dosage, should carefully reassess evidence of individual benefits and risks when increasing dosage to greater than or equal to 50 morphine milligram equivalents or MME per day, and should avoid increasing dosage to greater than 90 MME per day, or carefully justify a decision to titrate dosage to greater than or equal to 90 MME per day. Three. Long-term opioid use often begins with treatment of acute pain. When opioids are used for acute pain, clinicians should prescribe the lowest effective dose of immediate release opioids and should prescribe no greater quantity than needed for the expected duration of pain severe enough to require opioids. Three days or fewer will often be sufficient. More than seven days will rarely be needed. And four, Clinicians should evaluate benefits and harms with patients within one to four weeks of starting opioid therapy for chronic pain or of dose escalation. Clinicians should evaluate benefits and harms of continued therapy with patients every three months or more frequently. If benefits do not outweigh harms of continued opioid therapy, clinicians should optimize other therapies and work with patients to taper opioids in lower doses or to taper and discontinue opioids. When assessing risk and addressing harms of opioid use, CDC guidelines recommend the following. One, before starting and periodically during continuation of opioid therapy, clinicians should evaluate risk factors for opioid-related harms. Clinicians should incorporate into the management plan strategies to mitigate risk, including considering offering naloxone when factors at increased risk for opioid overdose, such as history of overdose, history of substance use disorder, higher opioid dosages, meaning greater than or equal to 50 MME per day, or concurrent benzodiazepine use are present. Two, clinicians should review the patient's history of controlled substance prescriptions using State Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, or PDMP data, to determine whether the patient is receiving opioid dosages or dangerous combinations that put the patient at high risk for overdose. Clinicians should review PDMP data when starting opioid therapy for chronic pain and periodically during opioid therapy for chronic pain, ranging from every prescription to every three months. Three, when prescribing opioids for chronic pain, Clinicians should use urine drug screening before starting opioid therapy and consider urine drug screening at least annually to assess for prescribed medications as well as other controlled prescription drugs and illicit drugs. Four, clinicians should avoid prescribing opioid pain medication in benzodiazepines or BZDs concurrently whenever possible. Five, Clinicians should offer or arrange evidence-based treatment for patients with opioid use disorder. This is typically medication-assisted treatment with buprenorphine or methadone in combination with behavioral therapies. The axioms of pain treatment provide current best practices regarding acute and chronic pain management. Along with the chronic pain, acute pain, and tapering flow sheets, these tools help practicing clinicians make compliance and appropriate pain management accessible and easy to follow. For acute pain, for most injuries and minor procedures, prescribe no more than a three-day supply or 10 doses of a short-acting opioid. For more severe injuries, prescribe no more than a seven-day supply of a short-acting opioid. Do not prescribe extended release opioids for acute pain. For chronic conditions with acute pain flares, 
Do not use opioids for acute flares of nonspecific musculoskeletal pain, headaches, or fibromyalgia. For acute flares of other chronic conditions, limit prescribing to a three-day supply of short-acting opioid. In rare instances, up to a seven-day supply may be appropriate. Check the state PDMP with any first opioid prescription. For subacute, meaning 6 to 12 weeks opioid use in transition to chronic opioid therapy, more than 12 weeks, don't start long-term use of opioids without a visit devoted to evaluation of suitability of long-term opioid use and discussion of all opioid risks and realistic expectations of benefits. Use non-opioid alternatives like non-opioid analgesics, graded exercise, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, and relaxation techniques. Unless opioid use has resulted in clinically meaningful improvement in pain and function, defined as at least 30% improvement documented with validated instruments, discontinue prescribing. If opioid use results in clinically meaningful improvement in pain and function, use best practice screenings for opioid-related risks. Assess signs of prescription opioid use disorder by asking the patient or family members about history of substance abuse. Discuss risks and benefits of long-term opioid use and document via a signed informed consent form. At every prescribing visit for opioids, the total opioid dose should be recorded using an online calculator and measures of pain and function using brief validated instruments. For chronic opioid use, meaning greater than 12 weeks, do not prescribe chronic opioids for nonspecific musculoskeletal pain, headache, or fibromyalgia. Do not combine opioids with benzodiazepines, muscle relaxants, or sedative hypnotics. Repeat PDMP check in urine drug screening periodically, based on risk. Avoid exceeding 90 MME per day. For patients with one or more risk factors, do not prescribe more than 50 MME per day. Non-pharmacological alternatives to opioids should be used and incented for most chronic pain conditions, especially multimodal use of reactivation methods in combination with brief interventions, such as cognitive behavioral therapy that can effectively address psychosocial barriers to recovery. Periodically ask if the patient would like to consider trying a gradual opioid taper to reduce dose or discontinue use. With regards to tapering chronic opioid therapy, Discontinue opioids if patient has not achieved clinically meaningful improvement, had an overdose event, develops a serious adverse outcome, demonstrates aberrant behaviors, or requests a taper. Tapering to zero can be accomplished in most cases by reducing the dose up to 10% per week with pauses as needed with or without adjuvant medications. A list of helpful medications to help decrease many of the side effects of opioid tapering is listed in Appendix P, Opioid Withdrawal Attenuation Cocktail, in the Pain Management Guidance document. Refer patients with symptoms of severe dependence or opioid use disorder for evaluation and treatment. If indicated, help patients get medication-assisted treatment along with behavioral therapy. For perioperative opioid use, for patients on chronic opioid therapy, develop a coordinated treatment plan, including a timeline for tapering opioids postoperatively. Doses by six weeks postoperatively should not exceed preoperative doses. For minor surgeries, discharge patients with acetaminophen, NSAIDs, or a limited supply of short-acting opioids. For patients undergoing elective surgery who are opioid naive, Opioids should only be prescribed if required to manage severe pain, and they should be discontinued as soon as pain is tolerable, no later than six weeks postoperatively. With what you've already heard, it should now be clear that chronic pain management can be challenging and rewarding. The evaluation requires attention to history and physical findings, as well as the use of assessment tools that may require additional time to administer and interpret. Treatment often utilizes behavioral, motivational, and other ancillary modalities. Follow-up requires attention to safety monitoring using tools such as the Nebraska Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, UDS, and pill counts. Most experts agree that pain management is best accomplished in a team-based care model, not unlike the approach of the treatment of other chronic diseases such as diabetes, congestive heart failure, and the like.
larger clinics can access nurses, counselors, OTPT, and peers within their organization. Smaller medical practices should develop strong relationships with local specialists who have expertise in the treatment of pain. Just as your patients often need help from their support network, providers also need help from others to institute the chronic disease model of care in the management of chronic pain. We've already talked about MME or morphine milligram equivalent. It's the amount of morphine an opioid dose is equal to when prescribed. This is often used as a gauge of the abuse or overdose potential of the amount of opioid that is being given at a particular time. Converting drugs to their MME measurements assists prescription drug monitoring programs, regulatory boards, enforcement agencies, and other stakeholders in determining the seriousness of the problem, evaluating the appropriateness of the prescribing and dispensing of these drugs, and assisting in prevention and treatment efforts. The CDC's new opioid guideline app, available for free download on Google Play and in the Apple Store, is designed to help providers apply the recommendations into clinical practice by putting the tools and resources into the palm of their hand. The application includes a MME calculator, summaries of key recommendations and a link to the full guideline, and an interactive motivational interviewing feature to help providers practice effective communication skills and prescribe with confidence. Separating your patients into high, medium, and low-risk categories is a common approach to determining the level of scrutiny to apply to a given individual. The advantage to risk stratification is that it allows you to provide additional scrutiny to individuals who are more likely to fail opioid therapy. The disadvantage is that all chronic opioid therapy, or COT patients, are at risk for complications of treatment, and risk stratifying your patients may provide a false sense of security to the clinician. There are several approaches to responding to red flags. If continued prescribing puts your patient at risk or puts you at risk of violating the law, then you may need to discontinue prescribing immediately. You rarely will need to fire a patient from your practice. You can discontinue prescribing while still maintaining a therapeutic and professional relationship. Increased scrutiny is often helpful to delineate whether you are dealing with substance use disorder versus other treatment issues. These strategies may be helpful. Increasing the frequency of UDS. Instituting pill counts and or callbacks, this means asking a patient to return to the clinic within 24 hours to evaluate and count remaining medication. Frequent query of the PDMP, increase the prescription refill frequency. It is understandable and predictable for patients to express strong feelings when they're presented with information such as the need to reduce or eliminate opioids. Opioid medications can become a patient's primary coping strategy for dealing with physical, emotional, psychological, and post-traumatic pain. Delivering a message about reducing or stopping such medications can be triggering and even terrifying for a patient and the patient's family. In such situations, patients' emotions are commonly first expressed in the form of anger directed toward the prescribing provider and healthcare team. When facing a highly emotional patient, it is helpful to consider what may be underlying the strong emotional expression. Often underneath the heightened emotional response such as anger is fear, grief, panic, sadness, or a belief that living without prescription opioids is impossible. Being curious and understanding about what may be beneath a highly emotional expression does not mean one should not take action in the service of safety. However, Treading lightly and following the recommendations will make for a more positive outcome. Remember, patients genuinely do not initially understand the rationale for tapering or removing opioids when appropriate. They also do not set out to develop problematic use patterns. Prior to engaging in potentially challenging conversations, it is advisable to spend time reflecting on the core values and principles that you are upholding in the difficult conversation. For example, it may be in the service of practicing safe medicine, being in alignment with your colleagues, the medical board, and or community, state and national safe opioid prescribing guidelines. When you are in alignment with your values and the healthcare team believes that the change is in the patient's best interest, the difficult conversations are often more manageable and rewarding. Physicians are taught to be compassionate 
They're taught to be patient advocates and that's a great thing. Patients who are developing a problem with these medications are unable to control their use of their medications or to even feel or understand why these medications may not be in their best interest. We're not very comfortable with paternalism, so it's often times that you hear a, a patient and a clinician going down a path that maybe they both understand is wrong, or at least the clinician knows it's wrong, but they keep working down that path. So we're trying to give tools that help a clinician have a respectful and compassionate discussion with their patient to say, this is no longer a good course, or this is not what I want a patient to be going through and this is why. Because the clinician and the patient relationship is really something that we want to leverage so that a patient knows we're being compassionate but we're going in a different direction. When asking a patient to do something they may be afraid to do or that they do not want to do, they may leave the appointment highly distressed, very angry, or inconsolably sad. It is common for providers in the healthcare team to feel that if a patient leaves in such a highly agitated state, the outcome of the appointment was a failure. Reconsider this belief. When a provider or healthcare team member asks a patient to make a change that is guided by core principles and values and a belief that is in the patient's best interest to make the change, then the state the patient is leaving in can be considered a natural part of the patient's therapeutic process. This is also a positive step toward the individual's overall health and well-being. Difficult conversations often bring about discomfort for patients, their families, providers, and healthcare team members. When we model our willingness to be uncomfortable to our patients, it helps the process. Consider saying to yourself before engaging in such a conversation, I am willing to be uncomfortable having this conversation because it is in the service of my value of safety and best practice medicine. It can be helpful to notice your own sympathetic nervous system activation, such as rapid shallow breathing, clenching your fists or jaw, and then engage in an activity to activate your parasympathetic nervous system, such as slowing down your exhale and softening your hands or jaw. Just as these situations can be highly triggering for our patients, they can be highly triggering for providers and the healthcare team as well. These conversations go more smoothly when providers or healthcare team members can identify which types of patients and situations trigger them the most and develop an intervention strategy to notice the trigger and proceed calmly and effectively with delivering effective patient care. It is important not to underestimate the relationship between the patient and the provider or healthcare team as a resource. Most patients genuinely care for their providers or healthcare team and want to work collaboratively with them. Often, genuinely communicating with patients that you will stick by their side through the changes can be one of the most powerful tools. Patients often fear their providers or healthcare team will abandon them, ask them to make changes too quickly, not listen to their fears, or fire them from their practice. Proactively squashing such fears and acknowledging that the fear is real to them will go a long way toward reducing those fears. Expressing the belief in the patient's ability to make the change is one of the most valuable tools for creating positive clinical outcomes, such as removing or reducing opioids. You may think the patient knows this. However, it is highly advisable to overtly tell the patient, even over multiple appointments, and even if it feels redundant, or if you don't completely believe that your patient will be able to make such changes. Over time, as you see your patient making such changes and actually increasing functioning and quality of life, you will be more confident in your patient's abilities and it'll be easier to relay your belief in them. Development of a treatment relationship in which patients are active collaborators in the process is an important component in making changes. Motivational interviewing, or MI, provides a basic foundation for engagement in treatment and commitment to making changes. The tenets to MI include empathy, develop discrepancies between present behavior and desired behavior, avoiding argumentation, rolling with patient's resistance, and promotion of self-efficacy. The belief is that the patient has the capacity to make change and the responsibility for their quality of life. The stages of change serve as a guide to the intervention. 
The spirit of MI includes collaboration, evocation, drawing the patient out, and promotion of autonomy. Confrontation, education, and authority are not considered part of MI. It is trying to motivate the patient in a way that is not dictatorial. It actually is a one-on-one, -on -one, you give and take type thing. You are trying to make the patient realize what is happening to them instead of trying to tell them. Instead of a paternal relationship, it becomes more of a team work to coming into their, uh, their issues. So I think that motivational interviewing is a much better way to approach a patient than uh, to just uh, dictate you have a problem. I think it's more of a team effort if it's uh, with motivational interviewing. In most cases, acute pain can be treated effectively with non-opioid or non-pharmacological options like ice or elevation. With more severe acute injury, short-term use of opioids may be appropriate. Initial opioid prescriptions should not exceed seven days for most situations, and two to three days of opioid medication will often suffice. If an individual needs medication beyond three days or beyond the average expected time for initial healing, a re-evaluation of the patient should be performed prior to further opioid prescribing. Physical dependence on opioids can occur within only a few weeks of continuous use, so great caution needs to be exercised during the critical recovery period. For assessment, review medical history, including records from previous providers when available. Administer a physical exam to determine diagnosis and appropriate care. Document baseline function and baseline pain. Determine whether the injury can be treated without opioids or if the severity of the injury justifies the risk of opioid therapy. With non-opioid treatment, help patients set reasonable expectations concerning recovery from the injury. Educate them about the healing process and the benefits of appropriate activity. Reassure the patient that some pain is to be expected and that it will subside in time. Over-the-counter medications will provide significant relief from pain in many situations and can be relied upon for ongoing pain relief after the acute period is over. Patients should improve in function and pain and resume their normal activities in a matter of days to weeks, depending upon the diagnosis. Reevaluate those who do not follow the normal course of recovery. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs, are a powerful option for treatment of pain. A list of cautions when prescribing NSAIDs is available in the Nebraska Pain Management Guidance document. If the severity of the injury indicates that limited opioid treatment is appropriate, before prescribing, you should perform a simple screen for substance abuse. Individuals in active recovery are at high risk of being triggered by even small amounts of opioids, and you can inadvertently put them in harm's way with your prescription. Those with a history of attempted suicide or overusing opioids should be prescribed the least amount of medication necessary. Identify other prescribed medications or conditions that would preclude co-prescribing opioids. Recognize benzodiazepines have a synergistic effect with opioids. Inform the patient about the risks and side effects of opioids. Many young people who became dependent on opioids say they were never informed of their risks. You may want to have the patient sign a treatment agreement if the patient returns requesting a refill of opioids. A urine drug screen and PDMP query should be performed prior to writing the second prescription. Continued prescribing might indicate the need for the patient to sign a treatment agreement. Opioid prescription should be the shortest appropriate period of time, usually two to three days of treatment post-injury or surgery, followed by over-the-counter treatments if further medications are indicated. Opioid overprescribing puts your patients at risk. Four out of five recent heroin initiates previously used prescription painkillers. Some major surgeries, injuries, and certain disease states may require longer periods of opioid treatment. Justification for prescribing outside the guidelines should be documented in the patient record. If pain continues, a reevaluation is usually indicated because pain beyond the expected time frame may indicate a complication. Complaint of ongoing pain may indicate an unrecognized substance use disorder, which may require greater scrutiny and an alternative treatment modality. At each follow-up visit, assess and document pain and function, 
and educate the patient on the importance of self-management and appropriate activity. Patients with acute pain that have no insurance coverage have a hard time getting follow-up, and thus they return to the emergency department. The four A's of opioid management are analgesia. Is the opioid leading to a meaningful reduction in the pain reported by the patient? Adverse effect. Is the patient experiencing adverse effects at a dose required to reduce the pain? Activity. Is there a measurable or a meaningful increase in the patient's ability to perform activities of daily living? Aberrant behaviors. Demonstration of an accumulation of aberrant behaviors is evidence that the patient is losing control over the use of the medications. This can become evidence of development of substance use disorder. With regards to the patient instructions, dosage instructions need to be clear. PRN prescribing should only be as liberal as necessary as it can lead to inadvertent large doses. The number of pills you prescribe sets up dosing expectations for the patient. Prescribing 40 pills for a time-limited painful experience may send an inadvertent message to the patient, giving permission for the casual use of opioids. For almost 30 years, a common medical wisdom held that most individuals experiencing chronic pain would benefit from daily doses of opioids. Medical knowledge has matured, and our understanding of the risk-benefit of chronic opioid use has changed, such that we now know the risks of chronic use are significant and the benefits are often modest. Most patients with chronic non-cancer pain can be managed with non-opioid modalities or occasional opioid use. One problem we now face is legacy patients, those who have been on high-dose daily opioids for years, sometimes passing from provider to provider. Many primary care practitioners care for these patients, though they may not have initiated the opioid treatment regimen. These individuals deserve compassionate care and may sincerely believe that they could not cope without continuing their medication regimen. However, current best practice suggests that a slow dosage reduction will improve the quality of life for the majority of patients. The characteristics that contribute to dose escalation for chronic pain patients are the same as those which predispose to addiction. When appropriate screening, safe monitoring, and dose reduction are instituted, some of these individuals will be found to have the true diagnosis of substance use disorder. Co-occurring mental health disorders related to trauma, depression, and anxiety may be revealed as well. Management of these emerging disorders may require a shift in treatment modalities or a specialty care referral. A strong partnership with behavioral health experts is essential to managing these patients. Involvement in daily activities and improved quality of life are the goals of chronic pain treatment. Monitoring function, rather than simply measuring the perception of pain, is the method of assessing patient improvement. Many patients do better after tapering and are grateful to have their lives back, despite their initial fears of dose reduction. Studies demonstrate that improvement in function is the single most important data point to demonstrate that opioids are effective and appropriate. Conversely, if no meaningful or measurable improvement in function is seen, opioid use is less likely appropriate. Let's talk about the categorization of chronic pain patients. It may be helpful to think of chronic pain patients as having pain belonging to one of three broad categories. Peripheral, which is pain whose etiology is ongoing peripheral inflammation or damage. This pain may be responsive to medications or procedures. Neuropathic pain, or pain resulting from trauma to peripheral nerves. This pain may be responsive to pharmacotherapy. In central pain, this phenomenon has many names, such as pain amplification and brain pain. Fibromyalgia syndrome is the classic example of this type of chronic pain. Psychotropic and other non-opioid therapies, including behavioral therapies, can be beneficial. Opioids are contraindicated with central pain etiology. All three pain types may coexist and may benefit from non-medication pain management strategies, cognitive behavioral therapy, movement therapy, and education. A pain rehabilitation program is strongly recommended as an adjunct to treating chronic pain patients. Some programs often include education, movement therapies, behavioral modalities, and peer-to-peer -peer support 
Patients should be educated about pain management techniques rather than expecting pain elimination. This is a strategy common to all chronic disease states. Attendance in a rehabilitation program can be effectively linked to a dose reduction regimen. A patient agreeing to supportive treatments is likely to succeed with a slow opioid taper. Resistant patients may need to be tapered more rapidly to assure an appropriate risk-benefit balance in a timely manner. Over-the-counter pain medications, as well as intermittent brief opioid regimens, may be beneficial in selected patients when exacerbations of the chronic state occur. For tapering, many legacy patients are likely to react negatively to a discussion of tapering. Preparation of these difficult conversations can be helpful. It is essential that patients be provided resources to assist them with the discomfort and anxiety that often accompanies tapering. Learn what local community resources are available to you. Many patients are on opioids and benzodiazepines simultaneously. It is inappropriate to have patients on both of those drugs, even if you are not the prescriber for both. Patients may be tapered off both simultaneously, but many prefer to taper off one and then the other. Since opioids are more dangerous due to overdose and can be tapered more rapidly, we recommend starting your taper with opioids and then tapering the benzodiazepines. When patients are exhibiting active addiction behaviors, an immediate cessation of prescribing may be indicated and accompanied by an addiction treatment referral. A patient's trauma history, mental health, family, and social situation can all affect the perception of pain. This is why chronic pain is described as a biopsychosocial phenomenon. Without addressing those behavioral issues, opioid management of chronic pain will not provide the level of relief the patient is seeking, and dose escalation, with its concomitant morbidity and mortality, will often occur. Studies show that opioids are only moderately successful in relieving pain and, in fact, are inferior to sleep restoration, mindfulness training, and physical exercise in providing long-term benefit. Listed on screen are non-opioid treatment options. First, let's talk about Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT, a program called Living Well with Chronic Pain, shared medical appointments, and peer-to-peer -peer meetings. More information on all three of these options is available in the Nebraska Pain Management document. Pain, in all its manifestations, is an aspect of most illnesses, as well as a normal part of the aging process. As such, its treatment is an essential component of primary care. The treatment of pain, especially acute pain, may at times require the use of opioids, which have significant risks in addition to their benefits. After years of misguided provider education, millions of patients in our healthcare system are on opioids for inappropriate diagnosis and at inappropriate doses. Even the most skilled providers may at times need specialty care to assist in the management of these complex patients. It is increasingly recognized that childhood trauma and PTSD affect not only the quality of life of many individuals, but also their physical health. It is not surprising, therefore, that exposure to traumatic stress is associated with increased health complaints, health services utilization, morbidity, and mortality. The prevalence of trauma is substantially elevated in patients with chronic pain. A current PTSD prevalence of 35% was seen in a sample of chronic pain patients, compared to 3.5% in the general population. Proper screening and referral is recommended for identifying and assisting these patients. For information on addressing pain in special patient populations, including children and adolescents, the elderly, patients with dementia, pregnant women, Patients presenting in an emergency room environment and dental patients refer to the Nebraska Pain Management Guidance document. Medication-assisted treatment refers to the use of pharmaceutical agents to treat opioid use disorder. Generally, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone sustained release are used for this purpose, 
Methadone and buprenorphine have the highest rates of success for opioid use disorder. An important consideration when weighing the risks associated with misuse versus the greater relapse rate associated with non-medication treatment regimens. Remember, those with opioid addiction are living with a potentially fatal chronic disease and deserve prompt and effective treatment. Naloxone is an opioid antagonist and as such, it is an antidote to the effects of opioid intoxication. It reverses respiratory depression that is the cause of death in an opioid overdose. Naloxone has essentially no adverse effects and is remarkably successful in reversing the life-threatening effect of opioids. The incidence of opioid overdose is dose-related, but anyone taking opioids is potentially at risk. Therefore, we recommend co-prescribing naloxone for the families and loved ones of all patients prescribed opioids for chronic use. There are many assessment tools that can assist you in evaluating and managing your chronic pain patients. A full list is available in the Nebraska Pain Management Guidance document. Additional resources are in the document as well. If we really continue to take the measures that we've been doing and really go at it full force, it won't develop in the same way as it has in our neighboring states, and that's a good thing. So really, we're on the other side of things, and we can be proactive. We have the luxury of being proactive, right, to some degree. So it's important to actually take advantage of that, because that way we're not trying to play catch up later on when we realize, hey, we kind of let this thing go. And I think we're in a really lucky state, um, both figuratively and literally, for that. Thanks for your time in reviewing this presentation on the Nebraska Pain Management Guidance Document. To download or view the full document, log on to dhhs.ne.gov and search Pain Management Guidance. Thanks for your time today and your efforts in implementing these important recommendations across the state of Nebraska. If you would like to receive free continuing education credit, Return to the Pain Guidance website education page and select the type of continuing education credit you would like to receive. Credit can be earned for both physicians and pharmacists.